In the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, we have recorded for us an interesting exchange between the followers of John the Baptist and of Jesus. If you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to flip there with me to Luke chapter 7. I'm just going to read two verses from Luke chapter 7. And just to set the scene as you're turning there, John sends his disciples, John the Baptist that is, sends his disciples to ask Jesus point blank, are you the one who is to come or should we be waiting for another? It's interesting to note that John the Baptist, the one in the early account of John's gospel, points to Jesus and says of him, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It seemed as if John was quite confident that this indeed was the one who was to come. And yet as we read on, at least in Matthew and Luke, we see his confidence start to wane. And so the disciples of John indeed go and they find Jesus and they ask him this question. And picking up the reading at verse 21 of Luke chapter 7, this is what happens. At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, and here is the answer. He said, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. We see here that Jesus answers this question to the disciples in a rather interesting way. He tells them to just look around, to look around and see what is taking place. In other words, he says, you should be able to know by my works and my words, that I am deed is the one who was to come, the long-awaited Messiah. In our passage for this morning from John's gospel, we have one of these such actions recorded for us, the healing of the man by the pool of Bethesda. And in this passage, we will see something of the identity of Jesus and his authority over physical sickness. And we'll pull out some truths from this passage for us as we seek to live in light of what we find in this text of Holy Scripture. And so as we continue our way through the Revised Common Lectionary that we've been following for the last number of months, our gospel reading is the one that we read for this morning, John chapter 5, verses 1 to 9, the account of this man who was healed by the pool of Bethesda. Now, you recall a few weeks ago when I was also in the Gospel of John that I explained that the first chunk of John's Gospel, roughly from chapter 1 and verse 19 to the end of chapter 12, includes seven miraculous signs by Jesus to show who he is, to show that he indeed is the long-expected Messiah. These signs here in this section and in the rest of John's Gospel are all to fulfill the overall purpose of his gospel, which he clearly states in John chapter 20 and verse 31, right at the end of the gospel. And he writes this, he says, these have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of God. And I love this line where he says, and that by believing you may have life in his name. It's not knowledge only, but it's a kind of knowledge that works its way into the heart so that it impacts us, so that we have life in his name. And the healing that we read about in this passage that Kayla read for us this morning is one of those signs. And so we're told that Jesus heads to Jerusalem for a festival. The festival is not named, but it was probably one of the three that required every Jewish male to go to Jerusalem. To Jerusalem. So it would have been the Passover, Pentecost, or the Festival of Booths. And so it was most likely one of these festivals. And so Jesus goes to Jerusalem. And the specific scene in Jerusalem for this miracle is by the Pool of Bethesda. 
And I'll ask Rhonda if she would flip to the next slide for me. And I have a photo. I know it's a bit small. But this is a photo of most likely where the pool of Bethesda is located. And I show this to you to give you a bit of confidence that the things that we read about in Scripture um, are, are true to real life. They talk about real places that really existed and real people, and some of which we actually know where they're located to this day. Now, I understand you can't really tell that there was a pool there, um, but nonetheless, as the years went on, things got built over top of the pool, and this is most likely the location. I get this from a book called Images of the Holy Land, and under the image, they say this, the pool of Bethesda, meaning house of mercy. That's what that word Bethesda means, house of mercy. It's located in the eastern wall of the city inside what is known as Lion's Gate. In the second temple period, the time in which this passage took place, it was a rainwater reservoir about eight to 10 meters deep. Sick people came to be healed in the pure water, which we just read about in this gospel. In the fifth century, a Byzantine empress built a basilica over top of the pool, and its remains and those of a crusader church of the paralytic were found in the excavation. And so it's pretty neat that we know the location to this day, most likely, of where the pool of Bethesda was located. And so there came to be a belief over time that this pool could heal people. Something would cause the water to be stirred up, and then people would enter into the water seeking healing. And we see this in verse 7 of our passage. John chapter 5 and verse 7, we see the man that Jesus is talking to explain a bit of this background. He says in verse 7, Sir, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. And so there was something that would happen, a stirring of the water, and then they would try to get into the pool to seek healing. And he says, while I'm trying to get in, everyone goes down ahead of me. And so we find in this scene then many people struggling with various illnesses and sicknesses, longing to be healed. And then we learn of one of those that are there, one of these people that is located by this pool longing to be healed, to be made well. And we learn that this man has been an invalid for 38 years. As I was reading, doing a bit of reading for this passage, 38 years was about the average lifespan of a normal person during this day and age. And so for 38 years, for the, the average lifespan of a human being at this time, this man had lived in this condition. And I think it's important to note the word that's used here, invalid. It's a word that I think if I was speaking, I wouldn't actually use that word. And I imagine many of you um, would probably feel the same. But the word that is used here, that's translated from the original um, by the word invalid, is more of a general word. It doesn't actually specify what the issue is. And so I think that's what they're trying to capture as they're translating um, with this particular word. So we don't know if this man was paralyzed. We don't know if he had some kind of illness that was just rendering him very weak and he couldn't move. But whatever it was, what we're supposed to know is that this man is disabled. In some way, he is disabled and he's been in this condition for 38 years. And our text says that when Jesus seen him, he knew that he had been in this condition for a long time and he asks him if he wants to get well. To this question, the man doesn't really respond directly, but he reports how he's tried, most likely over and over again, to make his way to the pool when it's stirred up, but he has no one to help him. And I think this is quite a sad story, that this man finds himself in the house of mercy, and yet he has received none. And that all changes when he encounters Jesus. For although this man had no one to help him, he was about to be helped. Although this man had yet to receive mercy, mercy has come to him. And with mere words, Jesus changes this man's life forever. He says, get up, pick up your mat, 
and walk. And we are told that at once this man was cured, that he gets up, that he picks up his mat and begins to walk. It's surely an amazing account that should strengthen every believer's faith as we look to this Christ who was able to heal a man with mere words. And for those maybe who don't believe in Christ, it should cause us to pause and think, what is it about this Jesus that with mere words, he could make a man who has not been able to walk for 38 years to be able to do so? And I think in this passage, if we could also read it in a spiritual sense, that we can see each of ourselves in this story. For each of us, Scripture tells us, are dead in our trespasses and sins, and we need Christ to come to us and make us alive in him. And so in one sense, it's the story of every true believer that we find in this passage, that when we are dead in our trespasses and sins, when we are unable to help ourselves, and when no one else is around to help us, Christ comes to us and transforms our life. And nothing is ever the same again when we have such an encounter with Christ. And this is none other than the good news of the gospel, that the one God of the universe who we are accountable to sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, who came willingly, who lived a perfect life, who died a perfect death, who was raised on the third day and ascended into heaven, where he is now seated at the right hand of the Father. Through this Christ and what he has done, we have life in his name. Every person who trusts in him by faith has life in his name. And if you've never believed this good news, I call you to not wait another second. It's the best news that we can possibly imagine that we can be made right with God through Jesus Christ. For it says in the book of Acts, there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. This is good news. This passage should give us confidence in who Jesus is, in his identity as the long-expected Messiah, the Son of the living God. And we also see in this passage his authority over sickness, that he, by mere words, can make someone well. Think about that for a moment. Scripture also tells us that the world was created through words, that God spoke and it was. And, and here we see Christ speaking and it was so. And we know that John's gospel calls Christ the word and that the word was made flesh. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. This passage and what we see Jesus doing should give us confidence in who Jesus is, that he indeed is the Messiah, the son of the living God, truly God and truly man, as the creed says, and that we can have life in his name. I think also when we read any account of healing, it also causes us to really pause and scratch our head for a moment. For we know, you know, I know, that all of us, I'm sure, have prayed for someone, and yet they've not been healed. And so what are we to make of such things? I ask you to think about the passage that's before us, Surely there were many, as the passage says, laying there that day who Jesus did not heal. He went to this one man and healed him, and yet there are many other there who were not healed. What are we to make of what seems to be, what is, an unsettling truth? And I'm sure it's something that's come across all of our minds. I think of us here as a church who week in, week out, pray for many people that they would be made well, that they would overcome whatever they're facing, be that cancer, be that a cough that lingers on. Whatever it is, we pray and we pray. And sometimes we see people get better through the medical system and we rejoice at that. But other times we know that it does not happen, that the cancer carries on, that the cough lingers. What are we to make of this? I think what we have to say is that certainly God can heal now just as he did then. But at the same time, we know that he does not heal everyone. And so we must continue praying for healing. But at the same time, we need to recognize that healing, or God can work, I should say, in different ways that might not result in the 
outright healing of the particular ailment that we might be praying for. As Andrew and I talked about this passage, as we were working through it and thinking, what are truths that we can bring out of this passage? He shared with me a story about his friend who struggles with an eye condition. He went to a particular church that was known for its healing ministry. And he thought, he was actually getting anxious, thinking that he might actually be healed of his particular ailment. And so he went to that service, and he actually came away healed, but not in the way that you might think. For his particular ailment that he struggles with continued. But what he told Andrew, and what Andrew told me, is that he came away with a healing of sorts that he did not even know that he needed. He said God worked in a mighty way on his heart and on his mind for him to be okay with the situation that he currently finds himself in. And so perhaps when we pray for healing, the healing might come, but not necessarily in the way that we think. I think this is also true, a truth that I pulled out of my New Living Translation study Bible, which says this, no matter how trapped we f- you feel in your infirmities, God can minister to your deepest needs. Don't let a problem or a hardship cause you to lose hope. God may have special work for you to do in spite of your condition or even because of it. Many have ministered effectively to hurting people because they have triumphed over their hurts. It could be that God is taking you through something so that it works on you, that he's doing it for your good and his glory, as hard as that might be for us to think about. Or perhaps he's taking you through this so that you can then one day go on to help and to minister to someone else. And so as we pray for healing, as we pray for God to work, we must recognize that he might work in ways that we might not expect, perhaps even in ways that we might not know that we need work. The final thing I would draw out is this, that as we carry on in life, a life that often comes with infirmities, struggles, cancer, uh, strokes, heart attacks, all of these things, for those who are in Christ by faith, we long for the day when all of this will be done away with. We long for the day that the book of Revelation speaks about in Revelation chapter 21. If you have your Bible, you can turn there with me. It's just a few verses from Revelation chapter one that speaks words that should come to great comfort for all of us. In the book of Revelation in chapter 21, we read these words. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. And these are the words I want you to focus on here when it says, He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Those who are in Christ by faith long for that day that will come. And I'll close with these words from a bishop, an Anglican bishop from the 1800s named J.C. Ryle, who says this, reflecting on John chapter 5. He says, well, may we be told to pray for the coming of God's kingdom. Well, may we be told to long for the second advent of Jesus Christ. Then and not till then shall there be no more curse on the earth, no more suffering, no more sorrow, and no more sin. Tears shall be wiped from the faces of all who love Christ's appearing when their master returns. Weakness and infirmity shall all pass away. Hope deferred shall no longer make hearts sick. There will be no chronic invalids and incurable cases when Christ has renewed the earth. And he offers these words, the author of this booklet, for meditation. Christ promises his people a glorious body like his own, a body transformed by his power. We who are in Christ who struggle in this life with all kinds of ailments and struggles, long 
for that day. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day that you've given to us. God, it's good to be here in this space to lift up our praise and our worship to you. And God, we long for the day of your son, Christ's appearing, when all things we made well. Until then, God, we ask that you comfort and guide us as we live out this Christian life that you have called us to. Help us to look to Christ, your son, as the Messiah, the very son of God, in whose name we have life. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.